Hi, welcome to Brookdale's Writer Series. I'm your host, Jennifer Kaminsky, and today I have with me Trudy Dittmar, author of the book Fauna and Flora, Earth and Sky, Brushes with Nature's Wisdom. Trudy, I'm so happy to have you here today. I can't help but thinking as I was reading your book, and I was so impressed by the writing, that we are so lucky to have you as a writer of your caliber representing Monmouth County and representing the very unique landscape that we live in. I mean, really, we have we have such a, an odd mix of being uh, surrounded by large cities and, and being surrounded by such dense uh, cities with such dense populations, and then and then countryside mixed with houses very close together and and kind of a forced countryside in some places. How has that shaped um, your love for nature and the way you've learned to write? Well, um, I'm very happy to be here too. Thank you. And um, um, actually, when I grew up in Monmouth County, it, it was. Um, pretty different from the way it, it, it is now, at least Colts Neck, where I grew up. Um, there were dirt roads. It was all farm country. There weren't a lot of houses or, or for right. it was it was much more. Um, it was it was farm country, but there were woods and so forth. And um, actually, as you know, most of the book takes place in the West. And there are really only a couple of sections in this book that really refer to to the East. Um, um, but 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 the way it shaped me was that my fa my father really had a big a role in shaping my love of nature and my love of the land. And we moved to a farm here when I was um, about five. And I grew up on that farm with him teaching me the names of birds and, and walking me through the swamps and teaching me the animals and so forth. And that's where I got the feeling for the land and for nature. And then when I transplanted out west, I, I kind of drew away from the land for a long while and lived in cities and did other things. Then I went west, and it all came flooding back again. My whole feeling about the land, and 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 I just changed my whole focus at that point. Okay. Well, I can really see from the book that you you have a, a very unique way of of weaving together um, your personal experiences through narratives and concepts from biology and science, and and your own um, observations of nature. Has that come about by your living these very separate lives and experiencing these very separate things and then over time finding ways to weave them together, making connections and finding metaphors? I think you're right. I think that that, that definitely has happened. Um, when I went away from the land, uh, sort of as a teenager and went away to school, got really interested in literature and then embarked upon my education and lived in New York and Chicago and a lot of other places, I was spending all my time with literature. I wanted to write fiction. I um, was teaching um, writing and so forth. And so that was a whole big strand of my life. And, and then I went west and I got all involved with the land again, really learning about it, starting to take science courses and do science readings and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, that was another strand. And in a sense, they started to weave together as I started to get back into writing again, deciding that I wanted to write about nature and to write literary nonfiction instead of f fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, so the two bounced off of each other, all the years spent with the literature and the writing, teach teaching writing, and then being in the land. So um, yeah, I think what you said is pretty on target. Now, do, I mean, we're all we're all as as writers searching to find ways to explain our lives and to find out the meaning of our lives, not just not just for us as individuals, but trying to find out our design, our, our place in the big design of the world mm -hmm. and and uh, the world of humans and also the world of nature. Mm -hmm. And um, did you find? It, it seems as though when you're you're looking for these metaphors, um, you're you're trying to find one thing to explain something else. Mm -hmm. um, does that happen over a very long period of time, or is I mean, were you were you thinking, okay, these two things connect the way cows don't have facial muscles, and <laughs> this is from the essay, right, um, from your book that cows don't have facial muscles, and then relating it to funny ears, and then relating it to why we think cows are, are dumb and, and why we try and separate themselves from it from them. I mean, are you are you going over a long period of time trying to find these metaphors? It seemed like these these essays must have taken years to write, just years of collecting information and, and um, trying to figure out how to make connections between these things. 
Um, I think the metaphors, once I really got back into the land again and started, I, when I moved into my cabin in Wyoming, I went out almost every day for hours and hours and, and just waited for things to happen or followed animals around or whatever. And, and, and I started to see all these things which suggested metaphors for things that were resonating with my own life. And they suggested themselves, um, as I would sit down and write, something would strike me. Um, um, for example, there's an essay in there about the, the salamanders, the pedomorph essay. Right, right. And I went and saw all these, these pedomorphs, these, these little salamanders in these pools paved like with cobblestones. It was as if they were paved with cobblestones. And um, I immersed myself after that experience. I thought that was an astonishing experience. I immersed myself in learning about, about them. And I wanted to write about that. And I started to write about that, that, that experience. But as I wrote about it, um, and thought about the dark side of it as, as right. opposed to the beautiful bounty and so forth, um, I started to realize if I'm going to write about this and write about my own life, I'm going to have to come up with something that has to do with abundance and darkness at the same time. And I started to come, then I started to come in with things from my own life that seemed to fit that sort of pattern. And I found a story from my own life that would, that, that, that could serve a as a metaphor for, and that could in a way serve as a metaphor for what I saw in, in, that, in that experience too. Okay, so not just searching for metaphors, but also being out there in the world so Absolutely. that you're, you're able to receive things as they Absolutely. happen. I never be, searched. To actually be there. And, and as I recall with the salamanders, you were out really far in a new place mm -hmm. that you hadn't been before in these right. glacial pools. Right. And I, I guess, I guess a, an important part of finding metaphors and making connections is to make yourself go out, and, and so, so uh, you'll be there when they, when they reveal themselves. Absolutely. The land, going into the land, came first. I never thought I was going to write again, and suddenly I did start to write again, and I was not searching for metaphors. The metaphors suggested themselves to me from what I saw. I mean, it just seemed to resonate so much. What I saw in nature seemed to resonate so much with, with my life and, by extension, with human life in general. Right. Right. I'm, I'm interested in the shift from fiction to nonfiction. Um, how did that come about? What, did you feel like the fiction wasn't working or it wasn't really saying what you wanted it to say? Or Well, I spent seven years writing a novel that mm -hmm. was a thousand pages long. And um, it, it, did, it was flawed in some, some ways that I didn't know how to deal with. And um, so I kind of had to I had to surrender and give up. And I thought at that point I wasn't going to write anymore. And then there's a long story about uh, how I got back into writing again. But when I did, it was um, someone had suggested to me um, that maybe I should try to write an essay. And, mm -hmm. and I was already living in Wyoming at that point. I'd already gotten re-immersed in, in nature and I was doing a lot of reading. And I decided to write um, an essay a natural history essay, and it just felt as if I had found my niche when I started to do that. Um, so I just, the fiction kind of works its way into the writing, um, mm -hmm. you know, all that I learned through writing fiction, and I use a few techniques that, that one would use in, in fiction, but um, that's kind of how I made the switch. I, I kind of had left writing behind, and then through nature I got back into writing again, and, and I was able to apply a lot of the things that I used when I wrote fiction. Did you feel like when you were writing fiction, fiction that you were trying to say things, you just couldn't find fictional ways to say them? So no. that when you... Oh, no. <laughs> no. No, what I found was that I was doing therapy on myself. And that oh, I was really, really... I mean, I didn't know that when, while I was writing. Really? Uh -huh. and, and I actually saw a long time after I'd finished uh, this huge thousand-page manuscript that that's what I'd been doing. Thousand and that, that there was some way in which I was viewing myself and life in a way that was very much askew. And so people would pick up sections of the novel and think it was really good because it was well written and because there were characters. Mm -hmm. But when you put it all together, there was something really wrong oh, because so of my relationship to my, to my own self. Uh -huh. And um, so that was, the, it wasn't that I, I couldn't find ways to do it. I always was really interested in, in the techniques and so forth, but it was, it was just that I, I, I needed to learn a lot of stuff before I, before I could have written that novel, and I hadn't learned it when, when I did write it. So, so was the writing of the nonfiction, the essay writing, was that the way of doing the self-exploration that you needed to do before you actually wrote the fiction? No, I think I did that exploration actually before I went um, 
went into the nonfiction oh, writing. The in-between part. Yeah, okay. there was a big gap between when I stopped writing the novel. I think I stopped writing the novel um, in 1987, and I didn't write um, any um, hist uh, literary nonfiction until 93. So I had a big gap when I didn't write. And I did a lot of exploration then. And then suddenly... Um, it felt like I'd tapped into the mainstream of, of the truth of my life in some way that I hadn't been able to tap into when I was writing the fiction. And so do you think this is your form, that you found the I do. Form? I think I found my niche with this. Yeah, good. I really do. Oh, that must be such a good feeling for it, you. It does feel good. Do you yeah. feel now that you can just begin to to write whatever comes in front of you, that, that now that you've found your form, there's not too much that you won't be able to express? I kind of feel like I have an awful lot that I want to do, and not nearly enough time to do all that I want to do. I suddenly feel that it's all flowing, if that's sort of what you're asking. Right. I, I don't have any trouble sitting down and, and having something to write about. My life has been in the way for a few years. There have been a lot of some deaths in the family and so forth, and I haven't written anything um, for a few years now, except work on this, um, the revisions and all that sort of stuff. But very soon now, I expect to get back to it and really go with it, oh, because there's not that much time really to to do all the things I want to do. Well, I'll be so happy to get some more writing from you, because I really <laughs> enjoyed you. this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We're going to take a break now. Again, I'm Jennifer Kaminsky. This is Brookdale's Writer Series, and we'll be right back. AIDS has killed more children worldwide than there are in all the grade schools in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, Atlanta, and Miami combined. The time to do something is now. Welcome back to Brookdale's Writer Series. I'm your host, Jennifer Kaminsky. Today our guest is Trudy Dittmar, author of the book Fauna and Flora, Earth and Sky, Brushes with Nature's Wisdom. Trudy, before break we were talking about um, how the essays come together, how you weave together seemingly disparate parts, um, disparate, disparate uh, pieces of uh, narrative experiences and, and scientific fact and observations you've made of nature. Mm -hmm. And and as I was reading the book, I, I the first half of the book felt a little different from the second half. Mm. The first half felt as if you were um, observing nature and, and trying to think about why things seemed unfamiliar to you or why things seemed funny to you or a little bit different and then doing research and coming back with facts that told you why mm -hmm. the natural world is the way it is mm -hmm. and then the second half of the book didn't really feel like that it had that same quality of I'm, I'm discovering is this as I go. Mm. Um, the second half of the book had more of an authoritative voice mm. um, that you were more knowledgeable about. You weren't just um, investigating the scientific facts. You knew what they were and you were, um, you were relaying them to, to the reader. And that couldn't, and then I, I got to thinking about how did, the development of this book come about? Is it in chronological order or uh, is it? No, not necessarily. Um, I, what I like to say about them, about the essays, is that of course each essay is a self-contained essay with a beginning, middle, and end. Right. Um, completely stands on its own, can be read alone, and many of them have been published before the book um, in, as self-contained pieces. But also, I, I really intended by the ordering of the essays um, that um, if read in the order that they're presented in the book, they actually become parts, even though they are self-contained pieces, they become parts of a larger single work, so that some of them are the beginning and some yes, are the middle and yes, some are the I end. Yes, I did get that feeling. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, and part of that, I mean, there, there is a chronological factor. Um, they are somewhat in the order that I wrote them. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it, there was that sort of development because when I started writing them, I hadn't been as immersed in um, in the scientific uh, studies and mm -hmm. and the reading and so forth. And as time went by, I did know more. So that's interesting. Nobody's ever said that before, but I think that's true. What you said about the change, right? Um, but also, um, when I discovered that I was going to do a book, up through um, the Salamander essay, I was writing essays, and I didn't know that I was going to do a book. Mm -hmm. When I discovered I was going to do a book, I said, now I can write some really long essays that oh, I could never publish yes. in a magazine or anything. I mean, there are some very long essays, that about three, and most of them are in the back mm -hmm. in the, in the, in, toward the end. Um, so that was a factor as well. Um, but I think you're right that um, the toward the end, I kind of, I, I, I had more, I had more of a base of of knowledge about about the natural world, about scientific theory and so mm -hmm. forth. And and I'm so impressed that that um, that you were doing your writing, and then you found a need, you found this gap in in the information that you had, and you realized you needed to get more information on science. And mm -hmm. so, what did you do? Well, in the beginning, I just did research. Mm -hmm. And then I decided um, I had taught at Brookdale for quite a while. And, um, and um, when was it? <laughs> in the 70s and, and early 80s. And I decided I, I was splitting my time between Wyoming and, 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 and here still. Mm -hmm. I was spending most of my time out there. But I would come back here in the winter. And there was a period when I had sort of chronic fatigue syndrome. I was always here in the winter. And I decided I would come back and take some courses at Brookdale. And I started, I took a ton of course, every course that Townsend Weeks ever taught out at, Brook, out at uh, Sandy Hook. And um, so I started doing that. And I started taking things, whether, I, whether they applied to what I was working on or not. Mm -hmm. So I did specific research when I had a question, why are all these salamanders in the bottom of this pool. Right. But I also was trying to give myself a background. In co when I went to college, all the core co curriculum was, um, co core requirements were thrown out. And I never took a whit of science or math or anything. Oh, uh -huh. And so I came back and I took bio and, and chemistry and all that sort of stuff. That's great. <laughs> so. That's great. And you took them here at Brookdale, too. I did. That's I wonderful. took them at Brookdale. A, a lot of them, yeah. Um, who can you tell me some of your um, your uh, writing influences? Um, I hear you're an avid reader. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I think um, some of them would be obvious and some of them wouldn't. Annie Dillard was a strong influence, and I think that's probably uh, obvious to anybody who's read that book and read any of Annie Dillard, particularly yes. Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek. Yes, yeah. I did make that connection. Um, when when you were tying, you would talk about one thing, and then you would talk about something else, and you would talk about. Then you would start getting into this, um, uh, let's say, uh, the, talking about the salamanders and giving all this biological information about the the salamanders. And I would be thinking, I would be thinking Annie Dillard because you're going on, and I'm thinking, how's she going to tie this together, right? And there's that suspense there, and then you come back and you bring it back perfectly. It really did remind me of her. Okay. Well, yeah, she's a pretty obvious uh, yes, yes. influence. But I guess other influences are more indirect, and I don't even think of them as influences except when people ask me questions like that. Uh -huh. And I've been asked those questions, and I realize Henry James had a huge, had huge influence on me, on my writing, I think. Um, I adored him for a big period and read. I did one of my master's papers on him. Um, um, Ernest Hemingway, when I was much younger, was a huge influence, and I think... I think it's there. I mean, it's not obviously there, but I think it's there. And um, Virginia Woolf was a, a big influence in a way. I, I think they're all in there, but I don't think they're necessarily sticking out. Okay. <laughs> Although the Annie Dillard one, I think anyone had, who had read Annie Dillard would say, yeah. But, yes. Yeah. Can you tell me about a little bit about your life going back and forth between New Jersey and Wyoming? Well, um, I did for a long time. I spent most of the year there, maybe nine, ten months a year, and came back here because my family was here. I, I maintained a house here, the same house that I had when I was um, uh, teaching at Brookdale, just a little house and called Snack. And um, um, then, as I said, there was a period in the middle of the 90s when I was sick a lot, and, and it was sort of this nondescript thing that nobody could figure out. And I spent a lot of time on the couch <clears throat> reading a lot of science, and, and I, that's when I took the classes. Um, 
but anything more particular you'd like to know about my going back and forth? Um, I, I considered that really my home. I mean, I never stopped considering this my home. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I sort of feel like I have a lot of homes, and Brookdale used to be one of them. But um, uh, I considered that my primary residence and my home, except it kept getting interrupted either by my own illness or, or things that would happen with my family and so forth. So, and, and in recent years, I've spent a lot of time here. Right. I, I've gone back and forth between East and West myself. Mm. And, and I really related to uh, when you talked about that in, in, the, uh, in one of your essays briefly about that yearning. When you're in one place, you have this yes. yearning for another. Yes. And when you're in another place, you're yearning for home. Yes. Um, it, has that found its way into your writing at all? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. But I think, yeah, when I'd be there working, suddenly New York City would pop up in my head or, or the farm. And when I'm here, I'm constantly yearning for there. Or at least I certainly was a lot of the time. So um, it's difficult to move back and forth. I'd be in one place and, and just not want to leave, even though I love the other place. I'd be very, I'd find myself putting off the departure, putting off the departure. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether it's found. Do you do you feel that you're kind of sustaining this sense of detachment by do by staying by, by having two having places? Always having to leave. Yeah, I would think that would be very difficult. I actually, it may be so, but I actually don't think so. I think once I get where I am, I get so immersed in it, even though the, the pictures pop up in the back of my eyes while I'm working or something, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm being detached. I think I'm very much immersed. Do actually. you have both set up as homes? Do they have the same feel in both places or, or different feels? Um, they might be different in some ways. Um, because I live in a log cabin out there. I, I live in a historic house now here, which right. is my parents, um, with my parents' things, all their antiques and so forth. So that's very different. Right. Um, but, you know, I, ha I have double, I have the same sets of books in both places in the same pots and pans oh, and, really? and that sort of stuff. Because after a while I was going crazy. I couldn't decide, you know, I need to bring all this stuff with me every time. Every time I come right. back, well, how will I do without this and that? So, um so I, I do have sets of things in both places, but they're very different, especially now that I've moved into the into the farm where I where I grew up, but which was my right. parents. Do you um, do you have a, a specific writing routine? Yeah, very much. I have to get up in the morning and um, not talk to anybody, not see any television, not not just keep the blank slate that I wake up with, and get to work as soon as possible. And when I'm working, I work between, depending on what stage of composition I'm in, mm -hmm. I work between three and six or seven hours a day. And out, out west, what I usually do is work maybe four or five and then spend the afternoon out just being in, in, in the hills and in the mountains and so forth. Um, but I, I'm, I, and I live alone and I don't talk to people for um, 10 days at a time, except maybe on the telephone. Right. Um, when I'm writing, I just really don't want any input <laughs> except my own. So. Are you, are you working on more, more than one piece at a time? No, I'm a very um, can't walk and chew, chew gum at the same time kind of person. I'm, I don't work on more than one thing at a time. Okay. Now, see, that surprises me because, again, I had that feeling that you were working on an essay over such a long period of time because the experiences span through so many different parts right. of your life. Right. But actually, I had accumulated most of that material when I started writing. I mean, the personal material, certainly. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I did work on, I mean, these essays, um, there are a couple of essays in there that I wrote in a few days. But most of them were months and months, and some really spanned maybe a year. Uh, and I would be sick in between, and I couldn't do anything, right, and then I would right. go back to it and so forth. So, um, yeah, some of them took a very long time. And, of course, then you think you're finished, and you go on, and you write the right, next and one. and you come back to and it. And you come back and do it again. So, in a sense, and, you know, they weren't all written. A single essay was not written at, in a single period of time. But I was not working on two things at once ever. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't do that. I'd go crazy. What is your revision process like? Are you, or do you start out with so much material and then take things out? Or are you stuck at one point saying, I know there's another way I can explain this, but I just haven't found it yet. And that's when you go out and you're hoping it will be revealed to you when you go out into the world. Well, no. I mean, I work on them till I think they're done. <laughs> and so in a sense, 
I, I revise as I go, and, and I am looking for, um, for pieces as I go along. But the real revision that happens is after I've laid it aside, worked on two or three other things, and somebody reads it and says whatever they happen to say. Mm -hmm. um, and then I revise. But um, actually, the, the essays in that book, there, there was very few revisions done to them. And my editor um, in the still, still Life essay about the plants, right, right. He, he didn't like all the T.S. Eliot stuff that was in there. Beautiful essay, yeah. Um, and so I reworked some. He said, I want to hear that more in your words than in his. And, and I refused to take out a certain part of it because I thought it was important. But I had a lot more in. I, I, I followed those directives. Um, um, there was something about the, uh, as I recall, about the, the the salamander essay where I got into world population and and tied that in as another strand of that essay, um, where he felt I needed some more development with that and so forth. But mostly, I was taking cues from from the editor when I did the revisions, and so I went back to very specific things. I all in, in my view, it was already finished. My view. Um, my view of things was complete as far as I was concerned. Right. I wasn't looking for more stuff. or And sometimes I took things out. That must be a wonderful place as a writer to feel like it's complete. And you've well, said it the way you <laughs> wanted to say it. Well, you know, I think everybody who writes feels that way. And then they find out, well, maybe not quite as much as I should have or as maybe too much. And, you right. know, all that after somebody else has read it and, and passed on their suggestions and ideas. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank and you. I really look forward to hearing uh, your reading tonight. Oh, Many thanks. people think that if they've read the book, it's, it's nothing to go see, uh, see the reader uh, read it out loud. But for me, it adds a whole new dimension to, uh, to the words and the message. And, and you also get to ask the writer questions at the end right. and, and right. find out uh, some answers. Well, thank you very much. I'm Jennifer Kaminsky. Thank you for watching Brookdale's Writer Series. And uh, we'll see you next time.